Welcome to Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, the podcast that deals with all things mental health. We talk to professionals, survivors, and loved ones about their sometimes informative, sometimes uplifting, and sometimes tragic stories. I'm your host of the show, Todd Rennebaum, advocate, recovering addict, experienced sufferer of depression and anxiety, and author of the children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Hello, and thank you for tuning in for another great episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. I am your host, Todd Rennebaum. This week, I'm speaking with Donna. She is the mother of Gia, and Gia was on The Bachelor and a couple of the other shows that The Bachelor did, but she passed away in 2013. She took her own life, and I am talking to Donna about that and what she was diagnosed with and, and the circumstances behind that. But first, I'd like to talk about next week's episode. Next week, I am talking with Jennifer Hutchins and Randall Scott White. uh, And they are involved with the documentary called Spiral. And it is an amazing film. I'm telling you, I, it was just so good. It was so good. It actually stars Randall and his wife, Michelle. Michelle was diagnosed with bipolar and with that came some trauma. Uh, she also had former trauma and uh, addiction issues. Uh, and I, I won't, I won't spoil it. I'm not sure what I can and can't say about the film, but it's it's a very very touching film. Uh, and Jennifer Hutchins, she is the producer of the movie. So we talk about the movie, we talk about how the movie was made and all that stuff, but also about Michelle. Uh, so that's next week. And I'm telling you, it's it's an amazing, amazing movie. You can actually go to mentalawarenesstoday.com and there's a trailer for the movie there. And also, this is how I ended up meeting Randall was, uh, was because he made a list of 15 top most useful podcasts about mental health. Ed Bunny Hugs and Mental Health happened to make that list. So I saw that and I reached out to him and we had an awesome conversation and just... Uh, it's just been amazing. I, I can't say enough about the guy and about the movie. Now, if you want to reach out to me, you just have to do that on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Twitter. Uh, Bunny Hugs and Mental Health on Facebook. Bunny Hugs Podcast on Instagram. Bunny Hugs and Mental Health on TikTok. And I think it's, I don't know, don't, don't use Twitter. It's kind of junky. Anyway, <laughs> I don't like Twitter. I hardly go on there. Uh, anyway. Uh, and, and if you really like the podcast, please, please, please rate and review. I cannot stress enough how important that is. Uh, and I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone that has done that. So thank you. So now back to this week's episode. Uh, Gio was diagnosed with PMDD. That is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. It is a disorder that women get. And a lot of women are misdiagnosed or not diagnosed with, with it at all because... A lot of doctors don't know about it. And if you want to learn more about it, please listen to episode 18 with Sandy McDonald. Uh, She actually helped me out with uh, getting in contact with Donna. Uh, So anyway, we talked to Donna about Gia, PMDD, and even some of Donna's diagnoses and uh, past trauma. So uh, I'll quit babbling and just say without further ado, I give you Donna. I'm going to be doing something with um, the Discovery Channel. Um, they're doing a document. Uh, some people are doing a documentary on reality stars and suicide, and that's important to me. So I, I'll do it. You know, something that I, I don't do things for ratings. For ratings, and you know that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, like you know, use her name and her t- tragedy as a rating booster. Yeah, exploiting her. Yeah, I don't. Ex- I don't do that. That's why I only did the Doctor Phil show when she passed away. Because all the other ones, it's, it's about the ratings, and they would have exploited her. Right. You know, and I'm like, no, I'm not having that. Why did you feel safe with Dr. Phil? You just... Because he's more, you know, he deals with health issues, too. And he tries to help people. And I had a message at that point to get across. Even though I was numb right after she passed away. I wanted all her young fans that are women to know, even teenage girls that adored her, 
to know that it's not okay to kill yourself. I didn't want them idolizing her for that. Right, 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 right. Which is kind of a thing right now. It There was some Netflix show that people were watching and it was kind of glorifying suicide. 13? Something like that? Something, something like with that. a 13? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't watch it. No, I couldn't. No, me neither. I've... I've had a attempt on my life, and yeah, it's yeah. Well, well I'm a suicide, I'm a suicide survivor myself. Are you? Oh, okay. Yes, I am. I had PMDD. Mm, okay. I was diagnosed at 42, so I get it and I understand it really well. Mm, okay. Uh, if you don't mind, just talk a little bit about Gia's early life and her growing up, and kind of maybe when she started, when you started to realize maybe she young girl may have PMDD? I didn't realize it when she was young because I didn't know at that point that I even had it. I have never heard of it. Right. You were 42, you said. Yeah. Oh, okay. She was a kid that liked to play with a lot of other kids. And she had a good heart. She'd share everything all the time. And I told her, if it's a brand new toy and you don't want somebody to play with it, then you don't bring it out. You bring it out, it's fair play for anybody to play with. That's that's good advice. <laughs> I spoiled her rotten. She got whatever she wanted. And then some. And she didn't act like a spoiled child. You couldn't. And she was an only child. And just by her heart, how kind she was, you would think she was one of many siblings. And she was an only child up until the age of 13, almost 14. Oh, I see. Because you did mention to me you had a son, so I wasn't sure if... Yeah, I remarried. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and and she was... She had a good relationship with uh, her dad and with your stepdad? She had, stepdad. A, she had a better relationship with her stepfather. Hmm. And his sons. Like, if people would have met us for the first time and seen all four kids together, because we have... She was a mine. My husband had two sons, and we had the... Book. My, my son together. So she had two stepbrothers and a half brother. And if you would have seen all four kids together, you would have thought they were together from birth. Hmm. So there was a bit of bitter turmoil in her younger life with her dad, dad and the separation. Yeah. And... Yeah, there was. He didn't have a lot of time for her. She grew up without a father image. When she, it was, um, we separated when she was about nine. Eight or nine, around nine. Hmm. And he didn't keep close contact with her once he separated. And he saw her a little bit here and there, but as she got older, she, if she called him and needed something, she couldn't depend, rely on him to show up. He had his own life. Did he have any kind of mental health issues too, or him? Yeah. Or he was just a uh, no. no. Okay. Just yeah. a just a dude. Okay. <laughs> uh, just a guy that was into himself. Right. Well, could be narcissism, maybe. Yes. <laughs> I throw that <laughs> word. I don't want to throw that word around <laughs> loosely because I just spoke to someone that has narcissism, so um, or was been diagnosed with narcissism. But um, so, now looking back now that you know about PMDD, uh, when Gia was first, you know, starting her cycles and stuff, do you, can you see now, like now we know what you know now? Yes. Yeah. Definitely. So she she had like depressed episodes and stuff doing her. She psych? had no no not depressed. It was worse than depressed. It was crazy. One time we lived near the ocean. Well, they were rebuilding our house. So we lived a block from the ocean at Long Island, and she ran into the water in the middle of February at night, wanting to kill herself. And this was what this. This was before I was even diagnosed with it. How old was she then, do you think? 15? Hmm. Yeah, 15. It was before her 16th birthday. Well, maybe it was right maybe it was right after her 16th birthday. Right, it was right around her 16th birthday. Maybe a little before. And then guess would try to kill us up all the time with the rages. And you, you could you talk to her and you didn't you had to watch what you say because you never know what was gonna set her off. And that I found out later that's part of it because I was the same way growing up. So you recognize that in yourself too when she was going through that? I didn't know at the time though. Right. You didn't know what it was called. You just thought. 
No, I just I just didn't never never associated it at all. You're talking about back in the seventies. There was no you didn't know clue. Honestly, people still don't really have a clue. No, they don't, and they need to learn. You know, it is very serious. Hmm. Yeah, my bet my best friend uh, has PMDD, and she's the one that turned me on to this subject and why I got a hold of Sandy originally. Um, I had. I had no idea until I talked to my friend. Like I've never even heard of it, and I and I, I was doing the podcast. Most don't. I was doing all types of mental health advocating. I have no clue. Yeah, I'm not a doctor. I'm not anything. I didn't re- I don't do much research on it. I lived it myself, my daughter, and if you ask me, it's treatable. And I, I when I got it, I was in, I was put in. I was taken out of my home in an ambulance unconscious and I get to the hospital then they realized that they did blood work and everybody says oh that's not possible I'm sorry yes it is because the doctor told me he did the blood work and my hormones I had a chemical imbalance in my brain due to the hormones and he told me what it was and they admitted me for psych for 72 hours and upon my, I took, in order to get released, I had to be put on Prozac and I had to see a psychiatrist once a week or twice a week for six months. And with that, he, we didn't talk about anything but retraining my brain to recognize all the signs. And he gave, he said something to me and it stuck with me. I totally forgot about it for years, but then with my daughter having it and everything it stuck me because with PMDD and you get it, you're, you start thinking that you're not worthy, that, you know, you look at yourself very poorly, that it's a poor me syndrome, I guess you could say. And you feel like everybody would be better off without you because you're a burden on everybody and you're not worthy to live. You really, at that point, have really no self-esteem and you just want to end your life. Well, the do- and you just feel like no good. The doctor said to me, he says, if a best friend was making you think like that, because that's what your brain is doing, making you think like that. He said, if you had a best friend that was making you think like that, would you fight them back if they were saying these things to you? I said, of course I would. He says, well, then go stand in front of a mirror when you think like that, because that's your brain doing it. He said, and tell your brain they're not going to win. He said, and he showed me how to recognize all the, all the signs when it's coming and not to, not to fall for it. And he trained me for six months. I don't even remember his name. But for the six months, I, I've never, after that, I've never tried it again. And I still have, you know, you live with it for the rest of your life. Even though I've done menopause and everything, I, I still live with the suicide ideation daily. Where sometimes I wake up and I want to say, oh, God, I hate it. I want to, I want to die. And I, 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 I always have my go-to on how to kill myself. When I feel too stressed out, that's the first thing you want to do. When you get really scared, you want to run and kill yourself. Because you're too afraid to live. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. I don't have PMDD, but I do go through suicidal ideation at times. And yeah, that's exactly what it feels like. It's like. Because that's like a comfort zone. Yeah. It's an escape. It really is. Yeah. It's your, it's your, oh my God, I can't handle life. I'm going to suicide. I can't handle this anymore. I'm going to go to suicide. It's, you know, it's your safe haven. But I know that I know better and I don't do it. Even though I have my I have my plan in the back of my head that's there forever, every day of my life that plan is there, but I don't act on it. Yeah. So that that doctor you saw, he's the one that um, diagnosed you with PMDD. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And this was back in like the year two thousand. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Pretty far back. Yeah. Yeah. I I used to tell me that. And I never knew what, he didn't say PMDD. He called it what it was, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And I couldn't remember it. And I totally forgot that I saw him. And until 2010, I didn't remember. Hmm. So nine years went by and I didn't have any clue about it. You know, it's like I blocked it from my mind. And then I was in the hospital with G with a suicide attempt. And she was unconscious in the waiting room. We spent like almost 24 hours in the waiting room there. And she was totally out of it. I asked the doctor to do a blood test. I says, there's some kind of thing. Uh, there's some kind of, oh, I don't know what it is, but it's a chemical imbalance in the brain. I says, can you check and see if she has that? He came back and told me, yes, she definitely has it. You remembered it in the waiting room. 
in, in the in the emergency room. Oh, sorry, in the emergency room. Yeah, and she she will not she would never accept that she had something because she couldn't understand because she didn't you know she was so out of it she didn't know what he said. Uh, she just wouldn't accept it. That how could that possibly be? Because then if you have to accept that you have a mental illness, kind of, even though it's a woman's illness too, they're both which is worse because that's what triggers it, then she wouldn't be perfect. And she strove to be a perfect person. And everything she did, she accelerated. It makes you think that if you want it hard enough, she taught me that if you want something hard enough, you can achieve it. You just can't quit. You just got to keep pushing for it. Yeah. I've been told that too, but I've quit lots of things. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just say I don't care. <laughs> Uh, so when did she get, uh, or sorry, well, how old was she when she was diagnosed? 2010. And she passed away in 2011? 2013. 13. Oh. She was going to be, she was going to be, she was around 26 when she finally got that, when she finally got diagnosed. And that was before she was on the bachelor? No, that was right after she did bachelor pad. She already oh. had did the bachelor. Then she went on to do the bachelor pad. And the way they portrayed her is like with this guy, Wes, that she was having something going on with him and she had a boyfriend and they split up. And for the first few months, it didn't bother her, but then it sunk in and that's when she wanted to die. So her being on, on the show like that, was it tough for her? Like she's already suffering from a, a, I'll call it a mental. No. Actually, when she did The Bachelor, she came off that plane glowing when I picked her up at the airport when she was all done. And I said to her, I says, you're really happy. You fell in love, didn't you? She goes, yeah. I says, yeah, with yourself. Because you have a, I could see the difference in who she was. But that was short-lived. But she really did. They gave her some self-esteem for quite a while. So in, in that case, it did help her. And they do when they do a background check on you, and they do a psychological. They, you're in eight, you're in eight there eight hours with a psychological, and this psychological they're asking you about sixteen thousand questions probably, and they'll ask you the same question about ten times, in different ways to see wh- how your answers are. That's how they can tell if you if you can do it or not. It, it's it's the same psychological probably that NYPD uses. Very similar. Oh yeah. And did they have to do that for every show or was it just the, the bachelor? Every, every person that goes on their shows. And then when you finish, you get psych, you get to see, you have to see a psychiatrist before you leave. Oh, okay. So they do take it seriously. So even before bachelor pad, she had to do, go through the same process and. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. I see. Hmm. They take it very seriously. So you can't blame the show. Listen, all these people that go on that show know they're going to be, it's going to be what it's going to be. They're going to use it to their advantage for the ratings. And when you go on there and you get drunk and stupid, then it's your own stupid, it's your own fault. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry for the truth. You know, they're going to use that. Yeah. If you don't want that, then don't do that. And it's, I, I, I know I've seen her season, but it's so long ago and you know, all the seasons blur together and I don't know what, <laughs> but was she pro, portrayed well and like uh, her, oh, she yes, got good the fact that she was she when before it came out on the air they were portraying her as a, as like uh like because they she was a model manhattan you know miss high society whatever they portrayed her as being stuck up i guess at the beginning i can't really think but i know they didn't like her before the show started but once the show started and they saw her they knew she was a sweetheart she even got annoyed at everybody for picking on vienna and she took Vienna's side. Mm, interesting. She goes to the underdog. She don't like when people pick on somebody. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I'm trying to get a, an interview with another person. I won't say their name, but they were also on a, um, on a reality show, and they were portrayed as the the villain, and they had a hell of a time coming back because social media, and yeah. and all that stuff. And so I, I wasn't sure if she had to deal with social media and negative comments or negative feedback or. She made a comment because they put me, they, they changed the words on me with something and they made me look like an idiot on the hometown date. And I was very upset over it. And, my, and she goes to me, Ma, it's only TV. It's not real. <laughs> it, you look good. It was good, Ma. Don't worry about it. Oh, so you were on there too. 
We did the hometown date. Yeah. Um. So, what 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 year was her last show that she was on? She did the Bachelor. She filmed in the end of two thousand nine. It aired in two thousand ten in January. Then over the summer of two thousand ten, she did Bachelor Pad. She wanted to win. This is what's the kicker. She wanted to win the money, not for herself, but to open an animal rescue. She did have a big heart. Oh, she had the biggest heart. When she was growing up, the one thing I taught her, this is great. This is a great. You said about her childhood. I taught her, we have to have the voice for children and animals because they can't speak for themselves. Well, she was in third grade and she had these, this girlfriend, a friend of hers who was a blonde haired blue eyed girl. And had a sister that was in fifth grade, also blonde hair and blue white girl. She came home with them to sleep over on a Friday afternoon from school. They were going to stay over. And she came to me, Mommy, can we take them in and keep them? <laughs> I says, what? She goes, yeah, they're going to go into foster care, Mommy. They, they have nobody that wants them. Oh, no. And the girl said, please, 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 please. I said, of course we could. But then the aunt, she was, I can understand where the aunts come from, that she couldn't take her nieces. She was only 25 years old and lived in a studio basement apartment with her boyfriend. Where is she going to have these two kids? How is she going to do this? She was in school and working. She was a kid herself. But she ended up keeping them because she, I guess maybe because she realized somebody else wanted them. The school was helping me try to get them and everything. But my, she always did that. Then in eighth grade, she came home with another girl with issues to help. And I taught my stepsons that too, and they used to bring kids home. <laughs> and then my little guy, he, he brought kids home. All my kids brought kids home. Oh, man. That would have been a full house. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you know what? You have to help the kids. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the thing. I don't, so many people are worried about, you know, n- number one, and that's it uh, in this world, especially No, you got you got to be kind. Yeah. You don't know what people, what, what shoes they're walking in. That's right. Yeah. I learned that the hard way. Yeah. Re- well, that's right. So once, once Gia took her life, you knew it was the PMDD that was a big mm-hmm. cause of it. Yeah. I was talking to Sandy the other day and she said it was like over 30% of women that are diagnosed with PMDD. I think so. I think a lot of women are misdiagnosed with bipolar. Right. Because they, the doctors do not know enough about PMDD. They don't even know it exists. So they just oh, just write it off as bipolar. And you got to be very careful with that because that you're giving a PMDD woman bipolar meds, which can make her worse. Really? It's not the right medication. Yeah. Wow. I didn't realize that, that it can actually make it worse. Yeah. So she was, well, I guess because you were diagnosed... You you had yeah. you had enough sense to plant that seed in the doctor, so she was never misdiagnosed like a lot of women are. She she was diagnosed with PMDD right away. Yeah. Uh. So so once Gia took her life, how long after did you come up with the 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 charity and the? We tried to start it immediately. M- myself, her boyfriend, his father, my husband, her best friend, and my niece helped us and we started some, but we never got anywhere. Oh, with the, with... We, had, we had all these meetings, but we never did anything. Oh, okay. So that's why you kind of joined. You. Yes. Okay. And this way maybe we could finally do something. Okay. We had a vision. Ryan wanted to open up a place where women can go to that have that issue and they can get, you know, made them feel good and this and that. And, stay there and have like a TV room, a game room, a makeup room to teach them how to get this, you know, teach them how to do their makeup and hair and dress so they can get some self-esteem. That never went off the floor. Mm -hmm. And and that was the, what what was the name of that first foundation that you started? The G. G. Alaman Foundation. Okay. And then you kind of joined with? Amanda and we called, we left it that name. Oh, I see. Okay. And, yeah. and then you guys joined with Sandy. Well, that was with Amanda and Sandy. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. And now it's the, I always forget the name, IA. MPD, International Association of Premenstrual Disorders. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, they're doing. Wonderful group. Yeah, they're doing wonderful. really great stuff. I, I, uh, they're doing, I wish that, you know, 
And I got so annoyed with Ryan because he decided to, he was going to do, he publicly said that he's going to help women. He, he doesn't care if he's the face to help women with this illness. Well, he didn't want to donate anymore. And he says, I did my time and left. And that was her boyfriend at the time? Yeah. Oh, okay. After after two years of doing stuff, he didn't want to do anything anymore. Hmm. Well, he walked away from it and never looked back. Was he on the show? Any of the shows? No, he oh, okay. he was a professional basketball player. Oh. Yeah, and he had plenty of money to help them. You know, I mean, who's you know, if I had his kind of money, I would have donated so much of it. I gave what I could, you know, but it's not my choice to say you have to do that. But in my eyes, you promised people. And you broke that promise. Yeah. So it sounds like she had a pretty glamorous life for the first 26 years. Oh, she, you know, 20, she passed away at 29 and a half. 29. Okay. Yeah. And she did. She traveled the world. She's been to most exotic places. With her modeling? Um, no, with, with her boyfriends. Oh, okay. And then she's on three different TV I shows. A few, place, a few places with modeling and co- and pageants, because she did a lot of pageants too, and appearances. And then uh, she was on three different TV shows and dated a professional basketball player. Oh, she did. She was engaged to a Yankee baseball player, one of the pitchers. Before Ryan. Before Ryan, then she was in, she was going with a hockey. A professional <laughs> hockey player. She liked athletes. I was gonna she say, yeah. Well, you know why? Because she can do her thing, and they're, they're doing their thing, and they don't. You know, she could do her traveling thing, and they're because they're busy with their sport. They're traveling all over the place, and each one of them she trained to be in best physical shape. Really? Yeah. Huh. They did very well when they were with her. They played very well in their sport. Was she a personal trainer as well? No, but she knew what to do. Huh. And when she passed away, she was working for Pure Bar. I'm not sure what that is. That's a high intense yoga. She is a go getter. Yeah, she knew the right foods because she suffered anorexia and bulimia when she was a teenager, also. And oh, okay. She, I brought her to places, but she wouldn't do it to get help. I tried, but you know what? When you take the horse to the water and they don't want to do anything about it, you can't beat a dead horse. Then you know, and it was like a, it was it made it worse trying to get her to these places so i said you know what we'll just work on it at home ourselves i bought the right stuff in the house i hid the other stuff that she couldn't eat i hid them i hid them in my bedroom closet so you actually treated her her eating disorders she didn't do it professionally with me and her together she would tell me what she would eat and we'd do it i'd buy lettuce i'd buy wraps i'd buy chicken Wow, that's pretty impressive to be honest with you. And fruit. And we, we, we. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. Uh, for those of you who have just started listening to the podcast, I'm going to recommend a past episode, episode 40 with Chad Miro and Spencer Mitchell. In January 2016, Chad lost his little sister, Chandra, her husband, Jordan, and their two kids, Cameron and McGuire, to a drunk driver, Catherine McKay. And Catherine McKay's son, is Spencer Mitchell. And I talked to them both. They are actually really good friends. It's it's a very, very good episode about forgiveness and just a heartwarming episode. So I recommend episode 40 with Chad and Spencer. We did it together. I'm sorry, I'm going dark. I'm in the kitchen throwing something out for my mom. <laughs> no problem. I'm sorry. No problem. How is your mom? She's going to be 90 next month in 23 days. Good. Three weeks. Good God. She's got a bit touch of dementia. Oh, don't we all? No, I got CRS. <laughs> what's, I have CRS. What's that? Can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying that since the 80s. I got CRS when I at work. No, I got CRS. I don't remember that. <laughs> well, I'm waiting for a ADHD diagnosis, and, and the memory is pretty bad with that, too. My daughter had, my daughter had that. Thank you. I forgot about that. When she was, when she started school, she couldn't take vitamins and she couldn't have anything with sugar at a young age. So I didn't let her, I didn't allow her much, can, very little candy. And we gave her special vitamins. 
that my ex-mother-in-law found for her, which worked, you know? So do you think the PMDD was kind of what caused the eating disorder? It was like just that anxiety and depression and all that, Elda? No, I just, I don't, I honestly, I don't know. She wanted to be thin. Oh, I see. Well, yeah, I guess she wanted to be a model and stuff. She wanted to be a ballerina and you have to be very thin. And she started out as a, eh, not too great. By the time she was in college, she got a scholarship because she was that good. For dancing. And yes, for Mm. ballet. Mm. She was amazing. And she, she had to quit because she almost had a nervous breakdown. She had to switch her majors. And it was because they, they really come, when you're good, they pick on you. Because and, and you have to be able to handle it there if you're going to handle it on the outside world. And I tried to explain, I said, gee, it's not that they, they don't like you and they're tearing you apart. I said, it's because they're preparing you for the, when you graduate and go out to the world. I mean, they would dance in college. She would dance eight hours a day and you had to bring lunch with you. And if you didn't bring your lunch with you, you're tough. You didn't get anything. And then you had your classes at night. God. You made your, your, your regular classes. Sounds terrible. It, she did it for a year and a half. And she couldn't do it no more. She had to drop out in the middle of the semester. Then she switched over to uh, major in elementary school teacher with a uh, minor in uh, special ed. And, and she finished that? Yes, yeah, she has a degree. And she graduated cum laude. Hmm. Did she do any teaching? No, she never got to, she never, <laughs> she was, so, she was making so much money modeling and appearances and pageants and stuff that she didn't bother. My uh, son just graduated high school and I, I'm trying to tell him like, just, he's so anxious about school and university and stuff. I'm like, man, so many people go to school, get a degree and do, do completely something else with it. So just don't worry about it, man. Just yeah. my son got his degree in criminal justice. And he didn't do anything with it either. He now works on the pipeline. Oh, yeah. Making good money. <laughs> yeah. And then my other kid got his degree in something in computers, but he's kind of in that field. Oh, okay. He's my non-biological son. Ah. I love him as much as I love my son. I went to the school of hard knocks. <laughs> 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 my husband, my husband... Didn't even graduate high school. Really? And then he later on in life, he was a college teacher for auto body. Ah, in the they trades. Had him teaching class. Yes. Nice. He is, he's an amazing body man. Hmm. Does he have an amazing body? Yeah, he's good looking. <laughs> he's good, yeah, he does. He good. keeps himself in shape. Hey, for a 64 year old man, he could pass for like 40 something. Really? Yeah. He could pass for my age? I'm 44. Yeah. Yeah, he could. Okay. I'm good. Good. This is way off topic now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Thank you, ADHD. Possibly. <laughs> you can't You can't focus. <laughs> Adderall. That's what they used to give people with that. Adderall. Is that what Gia took? Focus. She took it when she wanted to focus, and she took it with the PMDD. She thought it helped her. But she didn't know she had PMDD. She refused technology, but she would take Adderall. Hmm. Um, so did she have any treatment for PMDD once she was diagnosed? No treatment. Okay. Uh, no. Yourself? I took her. Once she was diagnosed, I dragged her to a doctor the next day. He was five five hundred dollars an hour. Hey yo. Yeah, and he does not take insurance. She did one session, and that was it. Good God. Yeah. Do you have any treatment for your PMDD or are you just kind of I just grin I just, and bear? I was, on treatment. I was on treatment for six months and that was it. Hmm. So I was good to go. So my friend, she, I think she takes SSRIs like yes. the week of, um, but no like counseling or therapy or anything. It's just more or less just a bit of medication. Well, you, you should have both. Yeah. Hmm. It'll work better. Right. Hmm. And you need to have a doctor that understands PMDD. Well, I think that's the hardest thing. That's the... But it's getting more and more public, you know, public now. It's getting more mainstream. 
Yeah. Thanks to people like Sandy. When I, that's what I went on the Dr. Phil show for, too, to bring it out to the public, that there is such a thing called PMDD. Did you get much f- and- feedback from that? Oh my God! Did I? I've I've got I got women that would call me and mess not call me but message me on Facebook and want to be my friends to talk to me and tell me that they haven't and thank you for bringing it out and talking about G with it and I I would try and help people I would talk to them and tell them you know they were suicidal I talked to a lot of women yeah, that would be a lot of pressure though too on you did you have to set any boundaries with anybody I never did no. I was there to help one thing. That's the only thing I was there for, to help save their life and not let them end it. Because my daughter wouldn't listen to me because I'm her mom and I don't know anything. But all women, because I lived it. And not just my daughter dying from it, I did too. So I get where where your head is at. And I totally understood what they were saying. And I could relate to them. And that was the best part was. That's what Sandy and that whole organization does. They're amazing with that. That's why my children were the way they were, because I'm a big helper. I'm, I'm the nurturer. I'm, uh, I'm not so much. <laughs> I nurture all the time. That's all I know how to do. Hmm. Your mama bear. My son just moved out on his own in May. He bought his house in February, and it took him three months to decide to move out. <laughs> okay, the house sat there for three months. Oh, I got to get I only got two weeks to get it done because my girlfriend... You know, his girlfriend got a job. But she's gonna. Eat. She's graduating college. The day she got her master's degree and graduation was the day they moved in. <laughs> he didn't, he didn't want to leave home. I guess. <laughs> he had it made. I moved out when but I was seventeen. Got, yeah, no, he was twenty. He was twenty-three. He's still twenty-three. Hmm. Then two weeks later, he gets engaged. They got engaged, which is wonderful. And then about a month later, they got two puppies. <laughs> And they both had brand new jobs. He was only working his job a month when they got when he moved out. Hmm. So he ha- his whole life changed in a, in the last six months. You're in Pennsylvania now. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you know, I can. Re- we're back and forth right now. We're back and forth between Pennsylvania and South Carolina. Oh, that's the accent I hear. Uh, what? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Oh, you have, <laughs> no, you hear New York. Yeah, it's New York, definitely. New York accent. That's it. <laughs> Proud of it. Do I have an accent? No, I just don't hear any. You sound just like me. I do not sound like you. <laughs> what Canada? Because eh? I'll interview some people. They're like, "Oh yeah, I can hear the accent," and then other I'm like, "What?" But whatever. No, I, but I don't hear the A. And you're from Canada. That's more of an East Ontario and and that area. I'm Saskatchewan, so I'm like. Okay. Now my daughter, the hockey player, he's from Mississauga. Oh, okay. Yeah. He he would probably say a. Yeah, we used to tease him, Canada. Eh? <laughs> Mississauga. Oh well, that's that's basically Toronto. I, I really appreciate the interview and talking with you about this. And so, I I, I feel like I'm underwhelming you. Usually, I'm hilarious. You are funny. Oh, okay, yeah. good. <laughs> I'd be laughing. <laughs> Usually, I'm very charming. All I know. All I know is I want to get this. I want to get this across to all the women with PMDD that have suicide ideation. I've been on both ends of suicide. Myself wanting to end my life, and my daughter ending her life with it. And it, you think you're doing it everybody a favor. All you're doing is devastating everybody around you, where they can't pick up the pieces. It's really tough. It's really hard. If you would see what it would cause you would hold your family tight and love them instead of doing that because that's all they want. They want to be with you. They want you. They don't care. Good, bad, whatever you have, all your flaws and all your faults. They want you because they love you unconditionally. And your friends, you, my, my daughter's best friends still are not over it. Nine years later. They're not, they're, they're just fr- they're friends, but that's how my point is. You had good friends that, their life is not the same, and it never will be. And they still miss her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you really don't know whose lives you touch. It, yes, that's the same. Suicide is not the answer. Even though your brain's telling you it is, it's not. It's reach out and call somebody and tell them, I'm suicidal. I need to talk to somebody. I need help. Brains are bizarre, man. Like, I know that when I'm well and, you know... I know that, but, and then when I'm in that mode, it's like my, I, you know, it's unbelievable that 
I I don't know that. You well, know what I mean? Put it on, write a sticky on on the mirror and say, when I'm like this, call somebody or go to the ER. Well, I've been to the ER before and they just sent me home. That was my first experience with suicidal ideation. Really? I was, th- this was like a little over 10 years ago, yeah. I, I went to the hospital and they just basically said, well, we don't have any room for you, so just keep taking your meds and go home. <laughs> and They could be sued if anything would have happened. Well, maybe. We don't sue a lot if in Canada. They- <laughs> they, you could have sued them because they, they shouldn't be doing that. You're walking in there telling them you're, you're suicidal. And they told you to take your meds and go home? Well, actually, that was 10 years ago and I started advocating and a lot of stuff came out and and things were changing in the province. But then about a year ago, a young guy uh, was suicidal and he was erratic, acting erratic. And so security hospital security kicked him out an hour later he was found dead about about eight blocks from the hospital and uh his family did sue actually they did oh, they? yeah yeah that's my point you know it's not about the money it's about you didn't take care of them and you don't i want public i want i want something it's not about suing for money it's suing to get justice because all the money in the world is not going to bring that person you love back Mental health care system, uh, it doesn't matter who I talk to around the world. I generally talk to Canadians, Americans, some Australians, a few Europeans and British people from the podcast. N- not one person has said, we have a wonderful mental health system and it works wonderful. There's always complaints about the mental health system. Oh, we have a me- great mental health system here if you've got tons of money. Right, yeah. yeah. If you don't, you... Like, how, uh, the f- jails... That, are full of schizophrenics and bipolar people and addiction. and. I got an example. I'm going to throw something at you. Britney Spears. Mm-hmm. I've, from the first time when she shaved her head till now, I say she suffers from PMDD. Interesting. Because, because she shaved her head after the birth of her second child. And a lot of women don't come out with PMDD till after they have a second child. And I, my heart bleeds for that woman because I don't think she's getting the right treatment. I really, in my heart, believe that's what she has. That is incredibly interesting. Yeah. A lot of people say she's bipolar. Or is she even, has she been diagnosed bipolar? I think so. But that could be the wrong thing because why is she so like this? If she's on these meds, it's, it's, the meds are wrong. You know, she's acting like this. The meds are wrong. And And it's no secret that way more women are diagnosed with bipolar than men. Like, what percent of that is misdiagnosed? A lot. Yeah. I, I think they just throw the women in there because they don't know what to do with it. <laughs> it's amazing how very few people know about PMDD. It's a lot more than they did 10 years ago. That's true. Yeah. I'm, a uh, lot more. Like you said, it was 2000 when you were diagnosed. Like, that blows my mind that anybody even knew what the hell they were talking about then. The doctor came up with that. And was he in New York? In Long Island. Long Island. Huh, interesting. I wish I could remember his name. There's that CRS. Can't remember it. <laughs> well, it's interesting, too, that you were diagnosed and then you just kind of forgot about it for nine years. And you know what I noticed? Too? This is my own observation. I asked, cause I asked a lot of women that I've met over the years with it, and I asked them, did you have, like, something traumatic in your life when you were young? Maybe, you know, because I know I did. And I know my daughter did. And can I think maybe that could be a trigger in your mind with it and how your hormones and everything work because you have, you know, there's something there. Like I said, I'm not a doctor or anything, but these are what I've questioned and took sur- my own little surveys on. Well, most people have. Well, it depends what you call trauma, too, some people. Uh, it could be your parents divorcing. It could be sexual abuse. It could be beaten, being beaten. It could be seeing somebody that you were very close to die. It's just any kind of trauma that's really traumatic for a child. Well, that's not that's not so, full science. That's just your own little research that you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's my own. No, no, no proof on any of it <laughs> ever. But that's what I. That's what I've asked women, and every one of them had something. Do you mind me asking what your trauma was? You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. <sighs> When I was really little, maybe a few years, maybe about five years old, I was at my aunt's and there was a schoolyard across the street and I was playing in there. 
And I had a dress on because I was at a party at my aunt's and my cousin's house. And it was boys playing basketball. And they came up to me and was trying to grab me under my pants, under my dress. And in fact, that, that was like 1963, 64. You don't say nothing. I just went home crying. I never forgot that day. And then, then my parents, I witnessed that. My parents getting, you know, divorced. My father cheating on my mom and missing her birthday. And she was sitting there at the window crying. It was just, I went through a lot with, the, with my parents' divorce. And the Catholic school shunning me and being bullied and made fun of throughout the school, throughout four years of my schooling in Catholic school. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. That's okay. Maybe who I am. That's true. And and you do you think so? You think that trauma may have? You don't think it's biological? You think maybe PMDD might be? I think it's both. I think I think women that had a lot of trauma are more sus- maybe more susceptible because their 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 brain or something is you know already damaged. Their heart, their brain, something's there, and then with the emotions of the period and you know, the hormones going up and down, you know, I think they're more it's more predominant and I think it is hereditary because I have it. My daughter had, and I think my stepsister had it. I'm not sure, but she had all the signs like I did. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious how, how hereditary it is. Like what are the odds of mother passing it to daughter? Cause my friend that has it, she's got two daughters. And so she's always well, wondering. I had it. My daughter had it. My daughter passed away from it. If I didn't get the help, I would have passed away from it. But you know what? I'm glad because I was a mom, and how could I leave my kids? What kind? Of, what frame of mind was I in to do that to them? Leave? A house? I would have left my daughter and my son without a mother. I didn't. I didn't see that, and I didn't think of that then. When my daughter when my daughter passed away, and I I waited for them to release her to bring her back to New York. And the day she was on a plane to come back, I was on a plane to come back, and I had my plan because I'm suicide ideation. I'm not staying here without her. I planned my whole suicide. I'm going to give her a beautiful funeral once in something she'd be proud of, and then I'm going to join her. I had that set in my mind already. Forgetting my son. Forgetting about my son. I got off that plane. My son had strep throat with 102 fever, and that, that, that plan went goodbye out the window because my son needed me. And I couldn't be with her. He needs me, and I can't abandon him. He's here, and he needs his mom. As, as painful as, as distraught and destroyed I was that I want to deal with it, I had to pretend every day for a, quite a few years, put a mask on in front of him. Because I always remembered in my back of my mind, I was watching those Lifetime or Hallmark movies where the sister ended up getting killed or dying of suicide as a teenager, and the parents totally forgot about the younger child. And they concentrated on the one that was killed and doing stuff. And that kid was tossed to the wayside. And I'm like, how could they forget they have another child? Well, I couldn't do that because of those movies. So normally those Hallmark movies are crappy, but they they actually uh, planted a seed. Yes, they did. I never forgot that. My, and my daughter always told me, Mommy, you make me believe in, you made me believe in the fairy tales. There, I said, gee, there's fairy tales. I said, it's nice to watch them and get the fe- nice feeling from them. But they're not true. It's not real life. That's why it's a fairy tale. I says it doesn't happen in real life, but it's nice to get away from real life and watch that for a little bit. If you're feeling down, you get you feel happy afterwards. It brings joy to your heart, a warmth. And that's all it's for. I normally like really dark sad movies. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't like dark movies because I always feel it like bring evil. I only like good. And the same with my music. Like when I was growing up, it was always like really dark, dark music and. My husband left. He says, "You like that song?" I says, "Yeah." He says, "Do you know what it's about?" I says, "No, I just, I just like the beat and the, I just like the way they sound." I said, "I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> I'm, not paying, I'm not paying attention. I don't care." Is there anything else you wanted to bring up that we haven't discussed yet? You know, I didn't think of anything because I figured you're going to ask all the questions. And I just answer them. <laughs> I just wing it. Yeah, me too. And uh, I think we did okay. I don't know. I just think that everybody needs to know they're not alone. There's always somebody out there to listen and hear you. There's the suicide hotline. There's friends. There's family. And you need to reach out to people. Don't be sh- don't be ashamed. It's not something to be ashamed of. Wear it proudly. 
That's what I said. I, I'm not afraid to say I had it and I, I'm a suicide. I'm suicide ideation. I'm not afraid. I I wear that like I'll put a pin on. I wear it across my forehead. I have suicide ideation. I have PMDD. Well, I don't have PMDD, but I've I, I've uh, I if if you can be a cancer survivor, a proud cancer survivor. Yes. I I'm I'm a proud. A suicide attempt survivor. I survived my. I survived my depression, and I'm. How many attempts have you had? Uh, one serious one. Also, just one serious one. Uh, one serious one. But how many others? Um, well, it's. It was weird with me. I would, at night, I would just like push knives against my throat, and I would like, but never, as an attempt. It was just like practicing. So it was like almost nightly. I was practicing, and then I did one serious attempt, and. After that, and then after that, I it was more just the thoughts again. My first attempt was nine. Oof, I was nine years old, but I wasn't smart enough back then. I tried it with a butter knife, so it didn't work. That was my first. Then my second attempt was I was about 14, 13, and that was with two bottles of aspirin. Oh, yeah. Oh, how was your liver after that? I ended up with um. A do a up, up a gastrointestinal ulcer by the time I was eighteen, because I've tried many suicide attempts with aspirin many times. Oh, I can never take it. I can't take aspirin now. Right. I I've, I've been hospitalized quite a few times. I lost my eyesight due to one time trying to suicide. I lost my eyesight for two days. I took all kinds of pills and mixed them all, and it messed me up really bad. Then four weeks later, I found I was pregnant with Gia. Hmm. So there you go. My hormones were changing, mm-hmm. and there was no reason for it. But I just, I just felt like I wasn't worthy of anybody at that point. And that attempt didn't physically that attempt put me in the hospital for two days. But it didn't physically harm the fetus, Gia's fetus. I was worried for nine months, but no, she was, she was fine. The only, the only thing she had, and she, she was an RH factor baby which had nothing to do with that, it had to do with my husband and my blood, my ex-husband's and my blood. I'm not sure what RH factor means. It's, it's, they might have to, when you're born and it's your yeah, RH factor, it, you're Billy Rubin and you can get very joint, you join this and you might need a whole blood transfusion. Oh, I see. And change blood because your blood is no good or something like that. Uh, no. I don't know. That was, that was almost 40 years ago. I haven't looked at it since. <laughs> and and G, G obviously she didn't, it wasn't just one attempt. She had tried many times. Uh, maybe four or five. And she was a and she was a Carter too. Oh, okay. I so forgot that one. And, and she would get tattoos. She would get tattoos because she liked to feel the pain. Right. Uh, let me tell you something. I wanted as I I wanted to die when my daughter died, and I could have chose suicide. I could have chose to turn to become an alcoholic, a drug addict. I could have turned it to whatever. I chose not for myself, but for my family to pretend I was normal. It's, I wore a mask for years that I hid. I dealt with my pain and my daughter's death a lot by myself. I wouldn't talk about it to anybody, how hurt I was. Matter of fact, the Dr. Phil show sent me to a psychiatrist and he pissed me off. I went, I went a few times and I came, I came home every time in anger because, no, I'm not ready to go that route yet. I'll do it at my pace, not because you want me to. And I just, just stopped going to him because I'll, t- I'll handle her death the way I feel best for me. And you're not going to tell me I got, you want me to cry because I couldn't cry. I was afraid to cry because I felt if I started to cry, I would never stop. And that would be, that would be my downfall. And my son needed me. And that was the only person I was staying alive for was my son. I felt like if I died, everybody else can get over it, not him. He was too young. So I had to put him. And you know what? At almost nine days before the one year of my daughter passing, I was told in the emergency room that my son might not make it an hour. He might die. They don't think they could save his life. What was so that I, was losing a, I, was, I was losing a section. My son was diagnosed about a month before with a lifelong illness of ulcerative colitis. And the toxins slipped into his bloodstream and caused septic shock. And he was at the final stage of septic shock that they think he was too far gone to save him. The doctor gave him morphine and made him comfortable and doused him with antibiotics. 
tons and tons, overloaded his body with it, and it helped save his life. My God. I thought I was burying my second son at, a year later. Is, is that the son you were living for? Yeah. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. And when she passed, when he got sick, all I, when she passed away, everything. No, when he got sick, all I cared about was seeing him happy. I didn't care about school. I just wanted the smile on that face. I'd do anything to make him smile and make him happy. Cause Did you do what you're supposed to do? I'm doing it now, Ma. I'm on the phone now. Yeah. So that was the most important thing was making my son happy. I didn't care about his grades. I didn't care about anything. Just him being happy because I'm not, I wasn't guaranteed tomorrow. That's all that mattered. Because if I can make him smile today and he's not here tomorrow, then I'd feel okay. I would I wouldn't feel okay, but I would say, okay, at least I did what I had to. You know, I I, I would have no regrets about what I did. I was being, trying to be the best mom possible. Well, it's almost time to be the best daughter possible now too. Yeah, I also so I'm the mom there now too. Well, yeah, I guess, yeah. I, I, I spoil her. <laughs> I make all the food she likes. You know, it's she she was there for me. I have to be there for her and it's unconditional. Who don't you spoil? People I don't like. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> All my friends, forget about it. I spoil my friends too. They need anything, they know they can come to me. They they, they don't have something. I say, oh, I probably have an extra one in the house. I'll give it to you. <laughs> oh, you need that? I got that. You can have it. Uh, they tell me, you give us the shirt off your back if we needed it. I says, yeah, I probably would. Are we friends now? Yes, we are. I need money. I don't have that. <laughs> That I don't have. Damn it. <laughs> I need money too. <laughs> I got to give it to my son. Oh, man. Thank you so very much for that, Donna. Uh, Donna actually doesn't do very many interviews anymore. And so I very much appreciate her speaking with me and uh, talking to us about PMDD and GIA and and her own traumas for those of you not familiar with pmdd i highly suggest you google it and read about it do some research if you are a woman if you know a woman if you love a woman if you have a woman in your family and and might be diagnosed with bipolar or something else um they may be misdiagnosed or might not be diagnosed with anything and pmdd is a horrible disorder so please do some research on PMDD. And don't forget, next week I'm speaking with Randall and Jennifer from the film Spiral. Uh, it will be out eventually. And when it does come out, I'll let everyone know because I really think everyone should watch this movie. I'm going to recommend it to addiction centers, to mental health centers, to, to everyone and anyone. Uh, so yeah, tune in next week. And don't forget to make your beds and take your meds. Bye.